You're listening to the smartest guys in marketing, the best show on the planet for client businesses to learn about traffic, funnels, sales, conversions, and marketing coolness. Chris and Taylor are the founders of Traffic and Funnels, a digital marketing consultancy helping you get paid clients from cold traffic daily. Now, here are your hosts, Chris and Taylor. Crew, what's up? It is Taylor Welch, and today we have a special present for you. It's not the typical podcast recording, but it is an interview I did, the first interview, in fact, in about two years. And it's one of my favorite people, and she will tell you that she's just a humble student of life and energy and everything, but this is a brilliant woman. And I went on her podcast and we talked about business and money and life and energy and goals and all of the good things. The title of this episode is Optimists Die First. So I hope you enjoy it. And uh, we will see you back next week with our regularly scheduled programming. See you. Hey, hey, friends. Welcome back to an excellent example of being human. It is my greatest honor to introduce to you Taylor Welch, one of my personal mentors. Super excited to have him on the pod today. Taylor, what is up? Never been more excited in my entire life, except for when (laughs) I got married. That was the one time. Wow. Okay. And can you tell me what you just told me like before we went online, why you're feeling so awesome? We're having a baby. Having a baby. baby Okay. I already forgot about that one. That's not what I thought you were going to say. I don't know what you were going to, I don't, you were setting me up, but I forgot what you were setting me up. (laughs) Sorry. You said that you started taking miniature naps in the day. Oh, just woke up from one. Yes. So right. It's way more important than having a baby is the nap. Fuck that. Right. (laughs) Exactly. I've been taking naps after lunch. For like 12 minutes, 13 minutes. And I, <laughs> I get the clock for 13 minutes. Here's, let me just save myself right now. Okay. So there's a reason for this. And I take a cup of coffee. Then I lay down for a nap. It takes like 15 minutes for coffee to like hit your bloodstream. So I go to sleep. I lay down on the couch. So you can't see it, but it's right behind me. I sleep for like 12 or 13 minutes. I wake up. Coffee has hit my bloodstream because I've been asleep for 13 minutes. I'm like waking up like, where am I? What is going on? I get a whole nother day. Then I get another cup of coffee and I'm like blazing for three hours. Wow. Okay. As a holistic nutritionist, I don't love that you're drinking so much coffee, but I, I like your formula with the nap situation. I can change what I'm drinking if you would prefer, but as long as it has like, you know, a little bit of caffeine in it, I'm good with that. Okay. I love it. And then you left out the best part that you woke up and you were like, and now I get to talk to Tori, which is also why you're feeling so awesome. Yeah. See, I just botched this whole thing. Like I thought you were going to, so you set me up. I (laughs) failed you. Sorry. Yeah. I woke up. I was like, Tori, where's Tori? (laughs) Um, Guys, what I love about Taylor is that he's like 18 years old. Nope. Actually, how old are you really? 28? I turned 30 in a week. Wow. So, the birthday podcast edition. Awesome. Okay. Yep. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Let's put this out on your birthday. Awesome. Okay. So you'll be 30. Why yep. do I feel like eons older than you? I don't know. How old are you? I'm 31. <laughs> Bro, maybe you're more mature than I am. That's yeah. Cool. Yeah. Right. Okay. So what I love about Taylor is they've grown their business to a multi-million dollar business. Taylor is just turning 30 years old. And of course, every time we're talking about income, we're really talking about impact. And how many students do you have coming through your programs per month right now? If you include everything like memos and everything. Yeah, everything. Probably 1,500 a month. That's insane. 1,500. That's insane impact. Okay. So before I make you go through the story of how you got there, where do you live right now? Just so we have a sense of where the you are in the world. Just outside of Nashville, Tennessee. In Nashville. Awesome. Where'd yeah. you grow up? I grew up in Louisiana and then spent part of my life in Missouri. Which awesome. is the worst. You never go to Missouri. If you're from Missouri, I'm sorry, but <laughs> very dangerous place. Never been there. Just wanted to confirm you're not like a Carnegie and you didn't grow up in the epicenter of New York City with a big trust fund. I would love to have that story for me, but no, I no. wish. Okay. And then what do you think you wanted to be when you're growing up? So this is really embarrassing. And this is honest. We can be honest with each other, right? Yes. You're not going to like chop this up and run ads to it and no. follow me around for the rest of my life. Okay, good. <laughs> I wanted to be the earliest conversation that I remember having with my parents about what I wanted to be when I grew up was I wanted to be a cowboy 
And then I wanted to be a preacher. So Ooh. I specifically wanted to be a preacher to cowboys. Ooh, there's, that's innovation right there. That ain't bad. That ain't bad right there. And I'm, of course, I think I'm like 10. I don't know how old I am. But now I wanted to work at a church. That's what I wanted to be. I never wanted to be an entrepreneur. In fact, if you talk to, you know, Seth, he was the second coach I ever hired. And he can tell you their entrepreneurial blood did not flow through my veins. I'm not one of those guys who was selling like, you know, lipstick and cotton candy to my, uh, you know, classmates. I wanted to work in the ministry and I got that. I didn't like it. And then we decided that we wanted to have like food and stuff and be able to survive, which is pretty cool. I got to admit being where I am now, food is awesome. Shelter, all of those things. And so I got into the game because of my wife who wanted help growing her salon. And so that was my first taste. I got to experiment on Lindsay's business and uh, then it was all downhill from there. So went down the rabbit hole. Yeah, right. And actually your partner, Chris Evans, who's also one of my mentors, uh, he was a missionary as well too. Yeah, so, you don't want to, he doesn't know it. He doesn't know anything. <laughs> Chris knows nothing. He's a schmuck. Dad of like 17 children. Yeah. Yes, just kidding. Chris is unreal. Uh, but I love that there's just so much soul in the history of you too, because this internet marketing realm, like it can easily get a bad reputation. Totally. It's perverted. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely perverted. Yes. Okay. So can you bring us through your poor, barely affording food? Your wife is a hairstylist. Yep. Yep. So like, we're like, like we're, we're, we live in Memphis at this point. We are to the point of poor where it's like, I literally, this is a, a true story. I'm not lying to you. And I feel like everyone makes up these stories now because it's cool for marketing, but mm. uh, this is a real story. Our first year anniversary, our apartment gets infested with termites. Okay. And I'm freaking out. I call the place and they're like, we can't come until Tuesday. And this is a Saturday. And I can't afford to get my own pest control person to come out. I have to use the apartments because I can't afford it. So these are like the kind of decisions that I'm making. There's a true story. I'm canceling a date night one time because my wife's car needs an oil change. Mm -hmm. So we're literally choosing between like, do we have a date night at Taco Bell or do we like go, you know, make sure the car doesn't blow up. And it's so weird to think about it now because it's like, you think that nobody makes, no, you're like, nobody lives that way. Mm -hmm. But people do, you know, they, they don't have any money. They have a hundred dollars max in their checking account. And that was us. It's kind of where we were. You know, I borrowed money to buy my first marketing book and um, read it on a vacation with my parents that they paid for. And it's just crazy to now where we've ended up. And I'm so grateful that obviously we live in a place where you can borrow money and you can have access to the things, but so much to be grateful for, especially looking back where you came from. So we can get all into that if you want to. But yeah, we were, we, we were really poor. We were like the bad side of poor, you know? Okay. Yes. And so you buy this marketing book. What was the marketing book? So the book by a guy named John Carlton. Yeah. It's called the entrepreneur's guide to getting your together. Okay. And you that's when I learned what I learned what copywriting was mm-hmm. in orange beach, Alabama. And it was John Carlton. And I thought I was so confused because I grew up a musician and we would get songs copyrighted. And I was like, how do you make money copywriting? Mm. He was like protecting, you know, IP with like the government. Totally different kind of copywriting. And I was like, wow, maybe I could do copywriting and get Lindsay, you know, some clients for her salon. That's how it all started. Amazing. And then what did you like literally do? What did you do from the book to then getting Lindsay some clients? So I literally told Lindsay, I was like, babe. I think we can do this. And uh, all we have to do is we have to send out like a hundred direct mail letters. She was like, great. I was like, okay, I need the money. Cause you know, she had like a business checking account. My wife, when, when she relocated, she had to start over her clientele. And that's why we were struggling because Lindsay historically came from a position where she made a lot more money than I did. In -hmm. fact, when we first met, I was like, this woman is rich AF. Like she (laughs) buys, she wears express clothes. (laughs) clothes. <laughs> I'm like, not me. I'm like wearing whatever people give me, you know, it wasn't 
like I had clothes and stuff. So I was like, yeah, we have to pay for it. It's like going to be a hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. And so we had to wait and she came up with a hundred dollars and we did it and we tried it and it literally worked. We wait, got you a, sent direct mail in the mail, direct mail in the mail. I copied a template that I found word for word to change out the name and stuff. And we purchased a list of names. Do you know this story? No, I really don't know the story. Yeah. So we, uh, cause you're like riveted. And I was like, are you pretending right now? Like, it, I don't know if you've heard this before. Yeah. We, I purchased a list of names in a zip code in Memphis and we sent out like a hundred letters and someone called her who we was like, Oh my God. Like someone called her. It wow. works. Indirect yeah. mail. Yeah. Direct wow. mail. Okay. So then you're hooked because it worked. I'm hooked. Totally hooked. I worked at a, I had transitioned out of working at a church and I was working at a real estate place. And I told them, I was like, I can do marketing. I'm a marketer. (laughs) And how did you get the balls to make that claim? Dude, I, for real, I, my dream every day when I went to work, it's so clear in my head because we had like these flyers outside the front of this real estate company. I was in property management and it wasn't fun and I did not like it. And I would have to fill up this little flyer thing. I would get to the office at 7.30, print out a bunch of flyers, put it in the little holder for people. And every single time I was out there, I'd be like, what would it be like if I could like work from Starbucks? Mm -hmm. I was like a big fan of Starbucks. I was like, what if I can learn marketing and I can do it for this company and I can do it for Lindsay and eventually Lindsay's income, I could grow her income to where it replaces my income. Boom, I could work at Starbucks. Just do whatever I want. And so I was just like, I'm just going to tell them I know how to do this. So I was like, I'm, I know how to do marketing because look, I'm getting clients from my wife and uh, you should let me do it. And so they actually paid me to do like some newsletter or something. And it was like, I would do four newsletters a month and I got paid $50 per newsletter. So I'm like $200 a month. No one can stop me. I'm like, I have so much freaking money. I will never cancel di- dinner for a oil change again. So it'll change is 30 bucks. I'm making 200 bucks a month. Like I'm the Holy grail, mm-hmm. you know? And then it just kind of grew from there. And I started getting my own clients, which was a journey in and of itself. And then experience rejection in a time frame in a magnitude that few people can comprehend, but I just went through it. I always tell people, you're going to pay the price. You're going to either pay the price over the course of five years, or you're going to pay all of it up front. A lot of people can handle paying all of it up front because it messes with their identity. It messes with their confidence. You know, people can't, people put their identity on what they do and have. And so I just went through that mess and I was like, I'm never going to be in a position like, dude, we got a tax bill one day. And this is after I was already kind of getting started in marketing. It was nine grand. So Lindsay's like, Lindsay didn't pay her taxes and she still doesn't pay her taxes. I pay them. <laughs> the IRS is listening. Like I'm paying you. Okay. But she just doesn't, she doesn't do that. She doesn't even care about it. We get a $9,000 tax bill. Both of my credit cards are maxed out. She doesn't have the money. And I was literally like, I will do whatever it takes short of like killing someone. I don't really want to get into that mess <laughs> yet. I also prepare for that. Now I'll do anything. Like I'll just, I don't want to ever want to be here uh, ever again, you know? And there was such a deep visceral drive for me to not ever experience that before uh, or, or again that I just was like, I'll do whatever. So I was trying to get clients from everywhere, man. I was like, I would, I would approach you at like Walmart and ask you if you needed a website. Wow. It was intense. Like people at church, I was trying to get people in my church to hire me to do stuff. And then it took me a long time before I kind of figured out that people don't really respond to that. And I had to figure out another way to get clients. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, eventually I replaced my, my day job income and uh, worked out a deal with them to go down to three days a week. And they gave it to me. And literally the first week of working three days a week, picked up two clients to set them out. Can't do, can't do three days even. Like I'm just got to be honorable to you guys and let you know, like I'm not going to be able to do it, you know? Have you always been like a burn the boats risk taker kind of person? I've always been intense, uh, Mm -hmm. but in different ways. I think this was probably my first experience where, but even still, like I didn't totally burn the boats. If you, if we look back with my job, I burned it different ways. So Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. A lot of people, they will just build up a savings and quit their job. Mm -hmm. I didn't do that. 
I was, I refused to quit my job until I had the income to match it. So I was kind of like playing both sides of the table. So I, I was like, I'm not going to, my family went bankrupt when I was growing up. So in addition yeah. to being poor for a while, I saw like firsthand, like what comes with being an optimist. Optimists, they die first on the island. Like they're the ones they get eaten. Mm. So I'm not really an optimist. Ooh, and I was like, can we talk more about that? Yeah, right now? Tell me. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Tell, can you explain that? Optimist. Yeah. Because also, if we're talking well, about psychology and energy, and I know that you're into all of that, you just told me to order levels of energy and power versus force. Have you started reading it? I've read them both already. Really? Yeah. This is what I love about you. You just do so fast. I already am teaching this stuff. So if the fact that it came from you as somebody who I com- kind of compartmentalize as not in the energy like space, it made it even more attractive to me. So yeah, of course I read them. Do you like them? I love, it's already what I was teaching, but it just gave me so, more verbiage to- It just gave you a little bit of ammo. So yeah. here's the thing. So okay. our sales guys, which you know a lot of them, Peyton, yeah. uh, Cole's in there now. We got a new guy named Tom who's come in. We have two setters. We're hiring three more people tomorrow. This is building as fast as we can. I don't, I'm not teaching sales anymore. I'm teaching energy. Mm. That's all I'm teaching. Because energy is money. Mm-hmm. And you can be someone who doesn't really understand how to like force close. But if you have the right energy, people don't even, they're just like, I just gave you my MS and I don't really understand why. And so I'm teaching them how to sustain that and prevent burnout. Probably be a really interesting conversation for us to kind of like compare notes. You know? Yeah, I would love that. But uh, optimist. So, okay. Can you explain the difference between, because like our beliefs, they're the fertile ground upon which we then act from. We continue to think and act. So if we're not looking at what, the possibilities could be. And maybe I'm just like interpreting the definition of an optimism wrong, but can you explain the difference between living in possibility and being an optimist? hundred percent. An optimist is to me, someone who believes that uh, everything is going to work out according to plan. Ooh. Okay. So the plan, not necessarily. Yeah. 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 Not necessarily someone who believes everything's going to be okay because that's, that's good. That's a necessary belief, but someone who believes that everything's going to be according to plan. And that's, mm. that's where people get stuck because what I want to, like, we're doing a lot of real estate stuff right now. And you should see our conversations with like our bankers and stuff. I'm like, if this deal falls through, we're going to make money. If this deal doesn't fall through, we're going to make more money. And they're like, well, you should go into banking. And I'm like, well, I don't want to go into banking because I make way more money than a banker. But I think like a banker in that, like, I'm terrified of losing money while at the same time, I don't get a you know, it's like it's both and at the same time. Okay. So the, what doesn't work in the optimism formula is the need for the plan to look like how you've planned it. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Cause that's just a f-ed up form of control, like needing to try to micromanage the external circumstances where you do believe internally, like in terms of beliefs and energy, you do need to live in the space of detachment. And uh, I guess I, I don't know how to say it in any different way, but like a belief that it will, it's going to work out. Well, yeah. Like, how do you feel about the worst case scenario? Uh, I'm not really afraid of the worst case scenario. I feel great about the worst case scenario. Okay. In fact, the worst case scenario to me, I'm still winning. The best case scenario is like, cool. I'm a billionaire. I just bought everyone. Yeah. So it's not, but see, as someone who's an optimist, they make their plans based on the best case scenario. Whereas we don't do that. Our plans are based on the worst case. Chris called it hedging. You've probably heard him talk about it forever. I he haven't. Mostly, he's no. called it hedging. So everything, we, we want to put a hedge around everything. It's where it's like, if this works out, it's going to be a really, really big win. If it doesn't work out, it's going to be a small win. And you have a thousand small wins, you're still winning. Could a small win still just be feedback? Or feedback. is it always around? Right. So, I mean, this idea of failing forward, whereas if you just do the thing you're going to get the feedback and even if the feedback is you did it wrong well at least then you get to pluck it out and do it better the next time is that still a win or are we talking like specifically you will always win dollars no it's not always dollars it's just okay. is something that takes you and you can define it as feedback but does it take you closer to the end game the goal mm-hmm. and okay. if you learn that there's a particular tactic that doesn't work does that take you closer to the end game yeah it does because you're not going to repeat it that's winning you yeah. Know? Okay. We're speaking the same language. hundred percent. Right. And I see that. I see that money sign behind you. It is not a, <laughs> I notice. Don't you know? And I'm, there's a, there's an Amex right up there changing hands on my, <laughs> well, <laughs> got the money thing done. 
We do. And you have a thousand. Nobody can see you because this is just audio. But Dude, I have someone cash here. here. It's no big deal. It's just like I just can't get money to leave me alone. It just follows me everywhere. Which Back was intentional. Here. You've curated that. Yeah. So my office, where I can't wait to show your new offices, by the way. Did you see the pictures on Instagram? Mm -hmm. So we're moving in in three weeks. And we are specifically like furnishing these offices to feel just really good and really nice. Because you have all these environmental things too that, that play into it. And I'm sure you've talked about it a million times on your show. But when you come into your office, your office should be, it should be a place that reminds you of the person that you want to be, not necessarily the person you feel like you are when you wake up in the morning. Mm -hmm. you know? And so you come in and I'm like, yeah, I've got the money thing there, but I've also got like a little plant. I got my candles. I've got a picture of one of my cars up there, which seems really weird. But if I come in, I'm having a bad day. I want to go into an environment that reminds me that I'm playing the game and I'm actually playing it quite well. Mm -hmm. And I need that reminder sometimes, not all the time, but some people don't have that. And you go, remember one of our sales guys one time who doesn't work with us anymore. I was on a Zoom with them just like this. I'm like, dude, what's wrong with you? He's like, man, I'm just really struggling. But then I noticed, and this was like a year ago, he's working in like a dark room. There's nothing on the walls, nothing around him. He's got a kid running around going crazy. And I'm like, this guy's not going to make it. And we ended up having to transition out because of his numbers. His environment was actually combating the vision he had for his own life. And so it's just like, it's just like running around the gym with the 20 pound vest on, you know, it's actually not totally conducive for you to set a PR. You got to be using it in a way that's going to empower you like you're doing with your money. Yeah. Yes. And this is what I love about you because you guys are, are experts in marketing. Absolutely. Right. And when I signed up with you, I thought that I was just going to get a massive kicking around marketing, but really you're actually super in tune. And you mentioned identity before, like you're current, you're constantly teaching people how to think and, and step into the next version of who they are. So for you, how did you get that lesson? How did you learn? Like, was there an identity crisis when you started making money? Like, how did you start to understand that that's such an essential piece? Yeah, I had an identity crisis when I started making money. I think I had like 15 identity crisis in the span of like a year when I first got going. So I come from church mm -hmm. and we're like, church people are the worst, even though we're really plugged into our church now. And I, you know, I freaking love Jesus and like, I'm all about that. And if you can't learn from me because of that, I probably make more money than you and don't care. So you can see both sides of my personality coming out in just that one sentence. Mm -hmm. But I had so many issues with money because of the way I was raised. Money is a bad thing. The love of money is evil, blah, blah, blah. and so. You know, when I made 30 grand from one client, I was like, dude, there's something wrong with me. It just felt really weird. Mm -hmm. I felt like I should give the money back. That was like my first indication that there's like something wrong up here because mm -hmm. my marketing was good. It got me a $30,000 client and 30K is now sitting in my bank account. And I'm like really, really happy about it. But at the same time, if part of me wants to give that money back, like I need to figure out what's broken here. And that kind of led me down. The path of reading all these books like um, T. Harv Eker's uh, Millionaire Mindset and all of these things about how you think, think and grow rich. That wasn't a book that I read before I was an entrepreneur. Everyone has read it now, but mm -hmm. I just started picking up the, this material and it kind of synthesized inside of my day to day in a way that helped me. And I've just grown from there. And you know, we've had 4,000 clients at this point. So getting to practice on people every day speeds that process up too. Can you teach us what normalization is? Something normalization. That often? Yeah. So I was at sushi with somebody in 2016. This is, we're still in Memphis at this point. And uh, it's this young kid who goes to church and he was like, can I take you to lunch? I want to ask you some business questions. I was like, yeah, totally. He said, what's the biggest secret? If you can only have one thing, if you had to boil everything down to just one tactic or hack or one thing, what would you advise me to pay attention to? It was like, immediately I was like environment. And I don't know how I said it or why I said it or anything. I hadn't thought about it before. It was like, it's environment. And I was like, a weak man in a strong environment will beat a strong man in a weak environment. And this is all, this is the first time 
that I had actually taken what I had been reading and what I had been dealing with and actually put it into words for someone. And so I, I learned that like what's normal to you actually impacts what you push for and what you feel like is acceptable. And it's like, a, it's like the thermostat. So if you have a thermostat that's set to 70 degrees and things get to 72, it's kicking in. It's, it's actually scientific. If you study, this was in the sales mentor a couple months ago, but if you study like scientific regulation, they have these devices now and they're designed to regulate variables and match it to a control. A thermostat is a simple version of a regulator. Our, our minds are the same way. And the, the, the process of doing that is called normalization. So if you want to make more money, the fastest way is to get away from the friends mm-hmm. who feel like 10 grand is a lot of money and get around someone who's like, if they only had 10 grand, they would freak out. <laughs> and it's osmosis starts rubbing off on you. If you want to lose weight, you need to get away from your fat ass friends, you know, and get around somebody who's like, they have six packs and all they do is count macros. And there's something about that, that forces you to come into alignment with your surroundings. And so my sales guy, like literally, this is the third salesperson. I I just forced him to buy a Tesla. Wow. Yeah. (laughs) He didn't have a choice. I was like, if you want to work here, you go get a new car. Because I'm like, how much money do you have in your bank account? He's 24 years old. He's like 70 grand. Like, dude, you were raised poor. You've been poor your whole life. You got 70 grand now, and now you're reducing your performance Mm -hmm. because you feel like 70 grand is a lot of money. I got to get you to a place where you don't feel like it's a lot of money. And that's not great advice for everyone Mm -hmm. because, you know, we're, it's textbook. Like I made it a thousand dollars and I went and spent a thousand dollars. That's not what he's doing. What he's doing is he's lifting up the environment. So he's normalizing being a baller Mm -hmm. because everything in his life is reminding him that he's not. Mm -hmm. And that's where normalization works against you. You're starting to grow. You're starting to be fruitful. You're starting to have more money coming to your life, more relationships coming to your mind. But you you are surrounded by trinkets that remind you you were born poor. That Mm -hmm. remind you, you used to live in freaking Ohio where like the most money people have is $1,000. You got to get rid of all the old stuff, get stuff in your life that makes it normal. That keeps you pushing. That's why people moved to New York City, San Mm -hmm. Diego. That's why you're in San Diego. Mm -hmm. You know, I love it. We have this conversation all the time. We could move back to Indianapolis, which is where my fiance is from. We could, for what we could get for two, three bedroom home here, we could have a 16 bedroom home in Indianapolis. But the beauty of living in an environment like this is we rise up to meet it. So instead of thinking, oh, well, now we need to cut back on costs. We need to get smaller. We need to get smaller. We think, no, how can we play even bigger to meet what San Diego offers? Yep. Absolutely. Yep. So for somebody listening who's like, okay, I am just like buried in my environment. I got kids. I got a husband. I just have been living in poverty my whole life. Like, what is the first step to even? Is it like listen to a podcast, read a book? Like, how do you start to like squeak in new stuff in your environment? Yeah, 100%. The easy stuff is like, what books are you reading? Maybe we could try instead of like your input is going to drastically change what it, your output like mm-hmm. so a lot of people their input is new girl every night on netflix so mm-hmm. it's like what if we what if we switch that around in a way that didn't cost you anything and you pick up a podcast like this one and you start hearing stories of people who aren't even 30 years old yet and they're buying three million dollars in real estate and you're like all of a sudden that's going to feel nasty and you gonna be like what the hell am i doing <laughs> like what is, you know that's yeah. a form of normalization because mm-hmm. you're actually Putting something in that actually challenges your status quo. That's the easiest way to do it. Masterminds and friendships and things that you can get involved online. You know, you didn't have to move to Nashville uh, to hop in CK. It's an easy way to normalize a bit of your environment because you've seen this. You hop in CK and Tanner's like 300 grand this month. And all of a sudden, everyone's like, I am way more mature than Tanner. (laughs) And who's doing like, what the F? Yeah. Right. All of a sudden, there's, and here's how you know that normalization is working. There's a little bit of discontentment for the things you used to be content with. Absolutely. All Absolutely. of a sudden you're like, you're still grateful, but you're just, you're just like a little bit not happy with the things you used to be happy with. You're normalizing in the right direction. Absolutely. Yes. In your crew seeing, I mean, you have 19 year olds in there doing 50, 70 grand a month, which yeah. I made before I met you guys, I think I made average 35,000 a year. 
which is fine if that's the life that I want to leave. But why don't I just go become a teacher then instead of busting my ass trying to, you know what I'm saying? Like why create something new if I'm just going to be making and only helping like 10 people a year? Just seeing other people who are doing these massive things all of the time, I have just almost accidentally raised my standard for how I need to exist all the time. Yeah. Which is why normalization is so great. Yeah. Because you, you don't have to push really hard for it to work. Right. You don't have to exert yourself for it to work. It's, it just happens in your subconscious with what you feel like is good or bad. Mm-hmm. And when that changes, everything kind of tends to line up underneath you know, that. Yeah, I agree. Okay. So tangible takeaway, people go start normalizing some bigger, better today. Okay. Taylor, why do, why does Mark buy a Tesla? Buy a Tesla. Right. Put it on credit. Nobody even cares. Just do it. Don't (laughs) quite follow that (laughs) advice because I don't want to hear how liable from that. Okay. So, um, Taylor, can you talk about the power of marketing? Like we said, this internet marketing stuff can get a really bad reputation. Why is it important for an expert to have that perceived value? Okay. So I'm writing a new book right now Okay, for us to launch. Um, It's called The Intelligent Advertiser. Mm -hmm. It's about marketing and advertising. And uh, one of the things that we, that I just put in there this morning, you know, we're, we're signing a lot of notes and we're doing a lot of uh, money transfers with banks and things like that. You have to have a guarantor. You have to have someone sign basically saying if, if push comes to shove and it hits the fan, um, I'm going to pay for this. And I had this idea when I woke up this morning and kind of got about the day. It's like, if you want a life of plenty, where every day you wake up with more opportunity than you went to bed with, marketing is the great guarantor. The ability to tell people about what you do Mm -hmm. and how it could serve them. It's the great great guarantor to literally that skill set can show up in your life, sign the dotted line and really guarantee that. Now, it doesn't matter what the economy is doing. It doesn't matter whether real estate is overpriced or underpriced. It doesn't matter who's president. You know how to communicate your value to everyone in your world. It's going to guarantee that you have opportunity to live a life of abundance. And so for me, the way that I view it is if there's one skill set that I think people should spend their time figuring out, this is the ability to communicate, which is marketing. It's a sophisticated way of saying it's marketing. Figure out how to tell people what you do. Mm -hmm. Figure out how to show people how you exist to add value to them. Not to take from them, but to add value to them. That's advertising. Yeah. And so what is the biggest mistake that you see like talented experts who could be really changing lives? What's the biggest mistake that you're seeing in their either marketing or lack of marketing? They're talking about themselves. Um, I heard a old, I think it was John Cable's old copywriter said that Great marketing isn't building a bridge from you to your prospect. It's building a bridge from your prospect to you. Mm. There's a distinction. There's talking about people today are talking about themselves. They're talking about how many videos are in their course. Right. There's things that just nobody cares about. Right. And rather than talking about the market, hey, if you've dealt with this, here's how to fix that. I'm not even going to charge you for this. Here's how much value I can add to you before you give me a credit card. And it seems like overly simplistic and I can just see it people rolling their eyes and like, well, teach me something tangible. Well, that is it. Like that's, that's literally the nuts and bolts. Pixels aren't going to fix you. You know, yeah. Infusionsoft isn't going to fix you. If, if you can't learn to connect with people and show them how like you were literally born so that they could have more advantage, mm. they could have more opportunity. They could live at a higher vibration. They could have more peace in their relationships, whatever it is. You can't show that to people then you're, you're going to be struggling. That's a mistake even marketers make. Mm-hmm. That's just great basic life advice too. Yeah. Like we are here to shine with our gifts, but also not to just like live alone on an island, like get out there and 100%. serve people. Yeah, 100%. Totally. Okay, so- Whether you're an introvert or an extrovert. Yes, which we are both introverts. Yeah. Yes. We are. I did an extroverted thing yesterday and came home and I was so broken and withered. I had what to What did you like, do? I did a photo shoot for five hours. Wow. Photo shoots are really hard actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We did one for the last elite event and I didn't like it. It was too hard. <laughs> I also like, because it just is paralyzing, like I'm great for the first hour, but then I just forget all like basic human needs. Like I forgot to 
breathe air and drink water and eat any food. So by the end, the photographer was talking to me and I was like, oh, no. <laughs> like you couldn't even move. Um, okay. <laughs> well, I love that you are an introvert and serving 1,500 people a month in the world, making the world a better place. I love it. Okay. Before you go, you have to answer a prompt from our jar. Every guest okay. adds a prompt and you need to add one. Uh, what's your definition of wealth? This is good. You know, why, you know why I got that one? Because you wrote a book called Wealth Secrets. I mean, literally, if you need more proof that energy works and gets you what you want. Yep. This is proof. Just saying, because before the show, can I tell, can I say this? Yeah. Before the show, she's like, is there anything you're excited about? And I was like, well, we just wrote a book called Wealth Secrets. And you literally randomly picked that out of the jar and it just set me up for Wealth Secrets. It did. Tell us. Same. Fix your energy. <laughs> Fix your energy. Hire Tori. Uh, what's your definition of wealth? Mm -hmm. It's still a hard question, even though it lines up. I would say my definition of wealth has recently changed. It used to be for the first, I would say the first two and a half, three years of running the company, it was security. It was, a, it was really revolving around like, I don't want to want for anything ever again. Cause I spent so much of my life wanting for things. So that was my definition of wealth. Wealthy people, you know, they don't have to worry about anything. Now, my definition of wealth is truly having the freedom to be able to impact and do the things that you feel i don't want to say led but really it's led like whether you believe in god or not you have to believe that in every human you know there's some there's something in you that pulls you to different things and to me if i'm pulled to something but i'm handcuffed because i don't have the means to do it that's that's the opposite of wealth mm -hmm. and so wealth now doesn't revolve around me anymore it's like and if i want to uh like we're, take, we're taking um, someone with us to a trip on like a vacation because they're important to us and we're, we, we are paying for it. That's wealth because it's like, mm -hmm. I'm able to, me and my wife are able to treat someone to something that will never pay us back, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So that's what's important to me now. I like that. Know? And I like that you acknowledge like back to levels of energy, which my people get this. They speak this language. The first space that you're in, you only have capacity to worry about yourself. So yeah. in many ways, you live a very selfish existence. And that the more that you work on impacting the world, the higher you get to operate. And now all of a sudden, you actually have space in your ecosystem and your vision and your mission to start contributing to the world. Yeah, 100%. Okay, can you add a prompt to our jar? What do you think about Donald Trump? Okay, <laughs> perfect. Have you seen um, the John Mulaney Kid Gorgeous? Uh -oh. uh, no. Watch it. It's so good. John Mulaney Kid Gorgeous? Do you know? Do you watch stand-up? No. No? What do you do for fun? Like, how do you have fun in your life? I, for, well, I love, like, this is going to sound so silly and cheesy, but, like, when I want to have, like, a great night, like, a great night. Yeah. <laughs> I literally, like, usually have a book that I'm really excited to read. <laughs> I'm such a nerd, like for real. And uh, I was made fun of, fun of so hard when I was like a kid because I was literally a nerd my whole life. But now I'm like, if I'm like, babe, I have great ideas for tonight. We'll pick up pizza. You watch a movie and I'll read next to you. It's like That's me too. the dream, the dream. Yeah. But what makes me laugh, my, my sense of humor is so stupid. We're like silly and dumb. Mm. I don't know why. I just think like the more dumb it is, the more I'm probably going to think it's funny. Uh, like, like dude, where's my like, car dumb like meet joe dirt dumb like i don't even know any of what you just you don't said. know any of those movies no. oh my god <laughs> okay. no people are like what well, how yeah people literally are like have you ever seen this movie I'm like no they're like what you haven't lived <laughs> I'm like dude i live very very well i just don't know what that is sorry you've inspired me maybe i can write a book of stand-up comedy then you'll consume you it. it just make it like Make it like kid level and then mix a little inappropriateness in it. And I'll right. like buy it and laugh for days. Okay. Probably. We have like the complete opposite sense of humor. Um, sorry. No. I'm sorry. All right. Okay. Well, glad to know. All right. <laughs> Poor Lindsay. That's the wild night for her. She needs a friend. You can come over and hang out. And you guys can watch. I would love to. Up. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Taylor, how can we find you? Trapsconfunnels.com. You can find me on Instagram. Instagram.com slash Taylor A. Welch. You can find me anywhere if you put that A in between put Taylor A. and Welch. Yeah, yeah, I actually Googled, like scoured the internet to find... <laughs>
talking about you and I found um, a teacher that was arrested for something inappropriate and a athlete in Dallas. Cause I, so, yeah. for real, here's why, like we, we grew this thing. So I haven't had time to do anything. We haven't done any SEO. I, this is my first podcast in like two years. Amazing. The last podcast was with uh, Kevin Rogers. I think we just haven't had time. So, but we'll do a million one this month. Insane. So, screw all the podcasts except for yours. Except for mine. Amazing. All of that will be linked. Taylor, I know I'm keeping you beyond your next meeting. Thank you so much for gifting us uh, your once every two years podcast. <laughs> Dude, that was my, that's my sense of humor. Okay. We that was are, smart. We're fine. We're that fine. was smart. I didn't say like a joke. I, that was a smart joke. Yeah. See, I'm not, I'm not just a dumb boy. I get it. <laughs> you know? All right. Thank you, Taylor. Thank you.